Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome to the very first episode of the Insurgents podcast. We are happy that you are joining us. I say us because I am here with my partner in crime, Jeffrey Harley, who I affectionately call Denzel, because Jeffrey reminds me of Denzel. When you hear him speak, I think you will also agree with me in that he sounds like Denzel Washington, and I think he looks like Denzel Washington. (laughs) But Jeffrey is a lead pastor of a church in inner city Philadelphia. He's also a chaplain. And about 10 years ago, he joined the Deeper Journey. And recently, he has joined the Insurgents. And he is presently preaching the gospel of the kingdom to his congregation. Amen. And some great things are happening. At some point... In this podcast, I plan to share with you an excerpt from one of his messages, which was a gully washer. It was incredible. I was so blessed to hear it. To give you all uh, an idea of what we're going to be doing in this podcast, essentially it's going to be conversations with Jeffrey and I. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover different topics related to the gospel of the kingdom. If you don't know what that is, if the phrase is new to you, or you've heard the phrase before, but you're not clear on what it means, there is a book in existence entitled Insurgents Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. And that is my contribution as to what the most important and the most powerful message of the New Testament is. And so this podcast is a supplement to that book, and we hope that it blesses you. But the format is interesting in that we're just going to have conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear Jeffrey and I bounce things back and forth and dive into various aspects of the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom. And then in future episodes, we will also play some interviews on this very topic. And we will also share excerpts of messages. And uh, I may have more partners who are on the same page as it concerns the gospel of the kingdom as well. But Jeffrey is going to be with me, conversing about many different issues in these initial episodes. So why don't you greet the audience, uh, Denzel? (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, it's an honor and a blessing to be here, to be a part of the insurgents, reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. An awesome book that I hope you've read by now that has made a fundamental paradigm shift in my view of ministry of the christian journey i just know that in these conversations and and in other podcasts coming in the future that god is is doing something through this and so i'm just blessed and just excited to be a part of this and with an expectant heart waiting to see what happens as we go forward in the future so thank you, Frank. Amen. Frankie V. I call, <laughs> this is Frankie V. Yeah, it's my boy. All right. I, I appreciate it. I'm down with it, Denzel. I'm down with it. What we would like to explore uh, in this conversation would just be about what is the kingdom of God exactly, mm-hmm. and, and particularly the gospel of the kingdom. And one of the things that I have said multiple times when I'm interviewed about the topic yeah. is that Once you try to define the kingdom of God, you have just emptied it of its riveting power. Yes. Because you've reduced this incredible reality down to an abstract, sterile sentence. And because the kingdom is so glorious and so incredible, there's so many aspects to it, like a fine diamond. Every time you turn that diamond, you see a different... Mm aspect of its brilliance that's how the kingdom of god is which really is another side of the eternal purpose of god once you define it you have just drained it from its power and its glory yeah 
And the other thing that happens as well is that people, particularly in the West, and specifically Americans, we equate knowing a definition or nailing a definition with having the reality. <laughs> so, you understand? But you know, and you know, Frankie V, at our fellowship, we've had five, five messages so far. Mm. And everyone is pushing me. Well, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Define it for us. It's so interesting you said that. And I've struggled with, well, you can't define it. Like you just said, it's like turning, you know, the diamond around and, and you see different aspects of it. But like you said, we have this proclivity in the West that if we define something, mm. it's almost like then we've mastered it. Yeah, right. And, and exactly. we can't master the gospel <laughs> of the kingdom. We can't master Jesus Christ. But it's like, yeah, so that's that's something, yeah, to, to even discuss because I'm pretty sure all those listening to us are just waiting with their pencil and paper. <laughs> right, and hand. Right. I just need this definition and now I can yeah. run with the and gospel. Then, of the and then once, yeah. once we've nailed the definition yeah, yeah. and we've confined it to a sentence, all right, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ never defined the kingdom of God. Yes. Ever. ever. And yet it was on his lips from beginning to end. When you see the opening of his ministry, the first thing he comes out with after he's baptized is the kingdom is here. Yeah. The yeah. kingdom is near. Yes. And he is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And even before the gate opens and Jesus walks through it in his early ministry, we have references to the kingdom through John the Baptist. Yes. Yeah. Through Anna and Simeon, you know, in the early parts of Luke. And then at the end of Jesus' ministry, what's the last thing he's talking about? He's talking the about kingdom. the kingdom. The kingdom. And then you open the book of Acts and what's the first thing you are confronted with? the kingdom. Jesus is talking about the kingdom in those days in which he is between the resurrection and the ascension. Mm -hmm. yes. 40 days he's speaking on what? The kingdom. the kingdom. And then at the very end of the book of Acts, you have Paul of Tarsus and what's he doing? He's preaching he's the, kingdom. the kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> and yet throughout all of that, the Lord never defines the kingdom of God. What mm -hmm. he does do is he illustrates it. Yes. He displays it. He yes. images it. The kingdom is like this. Yeah. The kingdom is like that. And you will also find in the New Testament concepts or remarks that sound like this. The kingdom of God is not such yes. and such and such, yes. right? Yeah. So I have found that the best way to really bring forth the impact of what the kingdom of God is, and specifically the gospel of the kingdom, is to illustrate it, to display it, to image it, and then also explain what the kingdom of God is it. Now there is, there is somewhat of a definition in the book Insurgents. Mm -hmm. There's a one sentence definition, but I only add it after I have illustrated and displayed and imaged and metaphorized and given many, many illustrations of it before I do that. And even then, the rest of the book is an unpacking of what those words mean in yeah. the actual definition. So, yeah. so it's a different approach. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, when I started reading Insurgents, I too was looking for, okay, what's the definition <laughs> of the kingdom? Right. You know, I heard things in seminary like, you know, the rule and reign of God. Which is yeah. so yeah. which is so insipid and so weak. Yeah. And it only touches a small aspect of the kingdom and misses the rest of the glory and the power of it. Yeah. And just that statement, the rule and the reign of God, I don't know about you, but that doesn't get me excited. That doesn't get me passionate. Yeah. What does that even mean? You know what yeah. I mean? Well, you talked about being on this, this deeper journey. And, and one of the things that I really love about the deeper journey, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the, the Deeper Christian Life Network, which is just a, an awesome fellowship of believers throughout the world. But out of Frank's ministry, the Lord always has him provide these, these practical handles, he calls them. And so I'm a very practical person. So if you say to me, the rule and reign of God, that's not, like you just said, it's not practical to me. It's, it's like, okay, so what is that? And like, how do, I, how do I do that, which I can't do? Yeah, and then what does that look like? And, and so I did the same thing. I'm reading Insurgents and I'm looking for, okay, where's the definition? What is it? And as Frank so much brought out is that 
Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know, except you're born from above, you can't see the kingdom mm. of God. And one of my favorites has always been the kingdom is like a man who finds a treasure in a field mm. and he sells everything he has sells to go everything. buy the field, wow. you know. So there's a devotion then to the kingdom of God. But he never, like you said, it never just comes out and says, this is what the yeah. kingdom is. What I also, what you just said, found fascinating, that's right there in scripture but is not brought out, and this is why we have to reclaim it, is that it's all that John the Baptist talked about. It's all that Jesus talked mm-hmm. about. It's all that Peter and the apostles talked about. I never looked at it. That Acts opens up talking about it, and Acts ends with Paul talking okay. about it. It's all right in there. It's, it's amazing. So this is why one of the reasons I believe that insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, this is one of Frank's best works. This is his masterpiece. And we are on the ground floor of, I believe, a a revolutionary Mm -hmm. move in the body of Jesus Christ throughout this world. Mm -hmm. So once again, I'm just so excited that the Lord has given me an opportunity to be a part of the insurgents. And I'm so excited that you came to join us as we're uh, chit-chatting from out of the insurgents. Yeah, exactly. We're sitting in a hotel room in Florida and uh, we had dinner last night, great conversation. We had breakfast this morning, great conversation. And so we thought, well, why don't we bring the rest of the world (laughs) into this little hotel room and listen to us wax on about the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom. And and that was the birth of this podcast. So let me roll this ball in a different direction and talk about some thoughts that are on my own mind and heart as to what the kingdom of God is not. Okay. And again, we're taking our cue from Paul when we go into that question and look at that perspective, what the kingdom isn't, because Paul would make statements like that. The kingdom of God is neither meat or drink. Yes. Right? Yeah. And and then he illustrates it with one particular illustration that captures an aspect of it. So what I have found since since the book released is that I've had some people write to me and say, I'm so glad you wrote a book on the kingdom. I have been preaching the kingdom message for the last 15 years. Now, they haven't read the book, Mm -hmm. okay. (laughs) so they don't know what I mean by by the kingdom Uh and the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And what I have discovered in virtually every case is that their concept of the kingdom is very different from my concept. Mm. That what I am preaching, what I'm presenting is different. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of talk about some of those differences. Okay. One of them is that this, this idea of the kingdom is that it's a bunch of principles Mm -hmm. that you set in motion that end up benefiting your own Christian life and moving God's agenda. So the conversational language is kingdom principles. Okay. And usually it's an individualistic thing. I'm going to put together these kingdom principles. I'm going to follow these kingdom principles in money, economics, finance, business, health. And Mm -hmm. so now if I put the kingdom principles together, and I follow them closely enough that I'm a kingdom person and I'm bringing the kingdom. But again, it's all individualistic. It's all individual, yeah. And I do not see that conversation that I just reiterated in Jesus or Paul. No. It's, no. it's not about putting principles together. No. You know, it's not about following a certain set of principles. The kingdom is, it's really, and again, this is an illustration, but it's an alternative civilization. Yeah that you are a part of with other believers in a local place. Yes, yes. You know, it's not this individual, well, you put your kingdom principles together in your own life and isn't it going to be successful, and I'm going to put the kingdom principles together in my own life. That that is not what you find in the first century Mm -hmm. church or in Paul or in Jesus. You follow what I mean? I follow exactly. Um, And then the other view, of course, is that the kingdom is way off into the future, and it's something we inherit when we die. And so our role, as far as the kingdom goes, is to try to get as many people into that kingdom door. So when they die, they will not perish in hell, but they will be part of the, this, this thing called the kingdom of God. God. And it's all pushed off in the future. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's true about that is it, it certainly is a future inheritance mm-hmm. in the kingdom. 
But the thing about the New Testament that is so arresting is that in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection, the future has been pushed into rewind and it's now in the present. And so we're living in the presence of the future, of the future. that we can enter into the kingdom that is tomorrow, we can enter into it today. And Sounds like already it. not yet. <laughs> already not yet. That's right. That's one of the theological terms yeah. for it. Uh, tasting of the power of the age to come. Of the age the to Hebrews. come. So when the Lord saved me, I started walking with the Lord, was in Newark, New Jersey. And so that kingdom principle that I heard, as you just described, as an individual in the body of Christ, it was always uh, coming out of what God's economy is. Mm -hmm. So as a kingdom person, you know, we were all poor. Mm. If you pay tithes and give, mm. then no matter what the world's economy is going through a recession or a boom, you will always have as a kingdom citizen because you operate in God's economy of tithing and offerings, you will always have not just provision, but more than your chest could even receive. And so it did become an individual piece and it was based out of money. I never really saw that in the New Testament. I saw, I saw people taking different texts and kind of putting them together to kind of put together this concept. So, that, that's where I heard that then. And I, I, I hear that in Philadelphia, too. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, from just my experience, that that's a message that obviously would resonate with a person who was poor, who was lacking. The second one that you just said sounds to me like what I've heard a lot is the, the gospel of salvation and works. Because, mm -hmm. and I just heard, I've heard that. I've heard that where people will say, we need to go out and evangelize more so that more people can be in the kingdom right. in the future. Don't you want your neighbor who, who isn't saved, mm -hmm. your son, your daughter, that person at the corner mm -hmm. store to be there in that kingdom with you? So it's an appeal through guilt yeah. to get people motivated to Amen, do something. And then, and then the final aspect really just comes out to being a pastor in Philadelphia and being around you know other people is the, the final end point. And I'm not saying this like um, just looking at their motives. I've heard them actually say it. It's to really build your own kingdom, which is your local church. Mm -hmm. To put, you know, the three Bs, you know, the building, fun, more behinds in the chairs, mm -hmm. and your budget. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what that ends up coming. And it really is a travesty to the real yeah. gospel of the kingdom of God. Absolutely. Yeah. What's interesting, too, going back to the the kingdom principle yeah. and the economic piece of it. I would guess, brother, that in that particular movement and the churches that preached it, the poor people remained poor and the people who got rich were the ones at the top who were receiving the tithes and the offerings. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I have seen too. Now, there's certainly, just so we're clear, Jesus certainly said, give and it shall be given to yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. But the motivation behind that is not, I'm going to give to get. To get, that's right. And that's manipulate right. God because I'm part of this kingdom principle thing. And if I do the right principles, then, you know, God has to uh, do what he said he's going to do mm -hmm. in terms of forcing his hand. The motivation then becomes very self-serving. Neither is give and it shall be given to you about giving an organization money to keep that organization going or to pay a clergy. Yes. Right. Through Absolutely. tithes and offerings, because as you know, we've yeah. talked about this and you're a pastor yourself. Uh -huh. Tithes and offerings were for the poor and the widows yes. and the yes. foreigner yes. and the oppressed. It wasn't for yes. the clergy. Absolutely. so to speak. Absolutely. And in the New Testament, we're all clergy. First Peter makes this very clear. Priesthood of all believers. Priesthood of all believers, all right. brother. All we're right. the Levite. We're all priests yes. Amen. in the kingdom of God. And so that's an example of taking a truth, mm -hmm. given it shall be given to you, mm -hmm. turning it into a formula mm -hmm. with a certain spin on it, 
and taking it out of its proper context absolutely and making it something where certain people at the top get rich yes and everybody else at the bottom is just living with this promise that hey i'm, I'm putting the principle in action yeah so eventually it's going to come back to me and as you said from firsthand testimony and the same thing i've seen the people under that <coughs> virtually most all of them continue in poverty and they're just making a few people rich at the top yeah yeah and it's sad in the book, that's one of the things in the very beginning, if I may quote it, on page 39, uh, under the chapter of Gospel Confusion, Frank says, years ago, I made an eye-opening discovery. The kind of convert made is the result of the kind of gospel preached and received. Mm -hmm. And so this is why this, this reclaiming of the gospel of the kingdom is so important, so significant, because how that's been parsed out with those different principles like that, because I've sat as a pastor and counseled with people who went out and got in trouble financially from following those principles. And unfortunately, you know, some even became melancholy about their walk with the Lord yeah. and discouraged and walked away. So there's a lot yeah. of casualties on the road. A lot of casualties, so, a lot of carnage. Yeah. So yeah. And to put a fine point on it, the gospel of the kingdom is not offering you a set of principles that you put into practice yeah. that are going to get you ahead in the game of life. That is not the gospel That's of the not kingdom. The, yes, yes, the gospel yes. of the kingdom is so radical. It is so powerful. It is so paradigm shifting. It's so earth shaking, but it's something that alters your entire life Amen. from top to bottom. <clears throat> And it lands you in a place where you have given your absolute allegiance, mm. not to a set of principles yes. or yeah. doctrines or truths, but to a person, the Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, as complete Lord and King, not just over your own life, but over the world. Amen. And that's a totally different <laughs> Completely message. Completely different. Yes, yes. And it's not yes. individualistic. Yes, yes, it has an individual piece, but it's not this individualistic thing. And that brings me to this other misconception, I mm -hmm. believe, about the kingdom. And I just heard a brother mention it recently. He um, said, well, we all know what the kingdom of God is. You know, the kingdom of God is within us. Mm -hmm. Now, right there, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. One, it is a misquotation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The best translations do not say the kingdom of God is within you. And the best translations do not say the kingdom of God is among you. The best translations say the kingdom of God is in your midst. Mist, yeah. And when Jesus uttered that phrase, he was standing in the midst of Pharisees. Yes in whom the kingdom of God was not present at all. Jesus said they were the sons of the devil. Mm -hmm. The devil is your father. Yes. So the kingdom is not inside them. Yeah. <laughs> right? And you will never find yeah. throughout the New Testament that the kingdom enters a person. Mm. We enter the kingdom. In the, in the kingdom yeah. so, so that's a misnomer, that this idea that the kingdom is some kind of inward experience that we have as a privatized individual mm -hmm. that's not what it is it's an alternative civilization that we become part of yes and that we live in and it involves other kingdom citizens yeah you brought that out in the book and it really made me go back and read those passages because jesus is in the presence of the pharisees yeah. and how would he say that the kingdom of god is in yeah. the pharisees who were his biggest opposition and so and you bring that out and so i went and looked at other translations and and, and studied that and yeah he's, he's like it's near you it's it's in your midst jesus embodies what the kingdom absolutely is in, in a bodily form but for years i walked around thinking that the kingdom was in me because i was told that when i said the sinner's prayer and i accepted jesus christ into my heart to be my Lord and Savior, that the kingdom of God had came into me, mm. which wasn't manifesting itself in my daily life uh, as far as, well, if the kingdom is in me, then why am I still falling short in all these areas <laughs> if his rule and reign is, yeah. is in me? So, yeah, so that's, that's another misconception that we need to bring out right from the beginning. I 
humbly say this because it's the truth until reading insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom i would have told you as a pastor <laughs> that the kingdom was in you mm. that the kingdom was in you that's humbling it just shows us again it demonstrates and showing what the kingdom is not and, and really getting to why this message needs to be reclaimed the kind of convert that we see in the Christian world mm. is a direct result of the gospel that they have heard yes. and received. Yes. Now that then puts the responsibility not on the Lord's people, but on those who preach. All right. You know what I'm saying? Amen. So I was just with a group of pastors here in Orlando. We spent three days together. Okay. All right. It was a uh, mastermind that I put on every year. Uh -huh. And all of these pastors, very gifted people. One of the common issues that they brought up was how do I get the people in my congregation not to be apathetic? How do I get them to be motivated to be more involved in what the Lord is doing and what we're doing as a church? Because most of the congregants, Jeffrey, they come and hear me preach yeah. this is what these pastors are saying mm -hmm. not just one but like most all of them they come and hear me preach they throw money in the offering plate they worship with us and then they go home yes and they live their own life during the week they're very busy you know they got all these things going on with their kids or with their friends or etc so for them church is once or twice a week. Yes. And maybe with a Bible study here and there. Well, brother, the kind of convert yes. that you have Come on. is the result of, of the, the gospel, gospel that you've preached. preached. And I have pointed out to them mm -hmm. that these people have not heard the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. Because if they had heard the gospel of the kingdom and there was a fleshing out of it, what it actually looks like, mm -hmm. they would either leave or there would be a big change. And by the way, this isn't about programs and getting involved in programs. Thank That's you. not what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about a completely different lifestyle that involves other disciples of Jesus. Yes. And a completely different way of life. So anyway, I just wanted to add that because that's what kept going through my head as they were sharing this because they were basically putting the responsibility, well, not all of them are doing this, but that's what goes on subconsciously is it's their fault, and what do I do to change it, right? One of the gentlemen pointed out, you're not just describing your church or my church, you're describing most churches in America and most Christians in America because for them, that's what Christianity is. It's going to church on Sunday morning, yeah, yeah. maybe Wednesday night, and that's basically it. And then, you know, pray and read your Bible. And that's what yeah. being a Christian is. Yeah. And Wednesday night is maybe 20%, you know, what, what you just said. You know, as you were saying that, Frank, as a pastor, one of the verses I say is Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then Peter and James talk about, as a person who's teaching, you're held to a higher level of accountability. Yeah. And so it's important for me, if I'm going to stand before God's people, to share that I get a better understanding of what the gospel of the kingdom is. Yeah. My personal belief is be walking in that to be able to share Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Amen. So I've got to be walking in it. I've got to be devoted, and, and in a later podcast, we'll talk about being radicalized and you know being captured by his glory, to be able to share that, mm. that I'm so completely empty of myself that the Lord can minister to his people and capture them by his glory, by his grace. And, and so I, I don't take that lightly. You know, it's interesting, side note, People tried to get me to get into pastoring because they saw that as a call in my life years ago. And I resisted only because I was like, I'm not getting up in front of God's people unless 
I know that this has to be him and what he wants me to share. Mm-hmm. I don't need the spotlight. I don't need any of those things because Jesus Christ is too important to me and the reverence that I have for him and what he's done just in my life. I can't play with this thing. We're talking eternal consequences here. Mm. Yes, this message that has to be reclaimed. And yeah, you pray and pour your heart out. But like you said, it seems like if people really heard it, the cost and, and what that what that entails and everything else. See, I'm almost speechless just thinking of the dynamics of that. But again, I don't want to go too far off of what we're saying here. Yeah, it's not a lot of the things that we think it is. And one of the terms that I've heard you use, uh, Frank, with the Deeper Christian Life Network is, I think we're like right now, like clearing the brush. Yeah. We got to clear, clean up the brush a little bit because, you know, I came into this with some assumptions, like I said, the kingdom is in me, right. different things. And, and so ask the Lord to just humble us, to be mm. open, what he wants us to hear and, and rid ourselves of some of our preconceived notions of what it is. The people who I met with this, these last three days, when I was with these pastors, these last three days, one of the things I said to them was the most important ingredient to the success of your ministry to the greatest impact you will have is your own personal transformation. Amen. That beyond the strategies, beyond the techniques, beyond the methods, beyond those new tools that you're given, what really is going to determine whether or not you are impacting God's people on a heart level, beyond all that stuff, I mean way beyond all that stuff, is your own personal transformation. That is the most important ingredient to the success of your ministry. Consequently, many, and this was confessed to by a number of the people who were there, many of the pastors, that's not on their radar. Their radar is... I need more information, I need more education, mm-hmm. I need more strategy, I need a better method, I need you know the latest technique that's working, right? Instead of, wait a minute, how's my transformation going? Absolutely. How's my, yeah. how's my yeah. conformity to the image of Christ? How's that going? And so we worked on that aspect together. You know, we had small groups and so forth. Some of those men, well, a number of those men, reported to me afterwards, they were crying. They had no expectation that this would happen. Yeah. It just caught them by surprise. One of the guys said, if this went on another day, I don't think I can handle it because I've been crying so much. Wow, personal. And these, these are pastors from all different parts of the country mm-hmm. from different theological pedigrees. Yeah. We got Southern Baptists, Methodists, Wesleyans, Pentecostals, Charismatics, you know, in the same room. Yeah, amen. And here they're getting together in groups Mm-hmm. And the Lord is touching them through one another, and they're weeping and they're crying, and it's all focused on their own transformation. Our impact in ministry, yours and mine, will be limited by how transformed we are. Amen. You know, we unpacked that and we talked about it, but this gets into the gospel of the kingdom. And the point you made is that how can I preach this if there's not first been some experience of it, you know, yes. in my life? And see, this is the problem with ministry today ministry today the whole focus is on sharing and disseminating information yes i get information boy that'll preach really good on sunday won't it so i get the information and i have it here in my frontal lobe and i got it memorized or it's on my notebook and now i'm going to transfer it to their Their notebook it's from one cerebrum to the other cerebrum one notebook to the other notebook and brother, nothing happens internally. Nothing, nothing. Because that's not what ministry is. That's right. That's right. You know, and this this reminds me, and, and I shared this with you, Frankie V. A.W. Tozer is reading his book, uh, The Crucified Life. And a thought that, that came to my heart out of that is that we replace revelation with education. Oh, amen. And, um, amen. The revelation of the gospel of the kingdom and the impact. You know, I start out by saying it, it has completely 
transform and is continuing. The Lord's willing, as we go through these podcasts, there'll be more transformation going on, <laughs> even as we speak. But walking in it, when something has impacted your life, you can tell because there's a passion about it. Yes, there's amen, a passion. Brother. You, you, can't, you can't train somebody to be passionate. You can't teach somebody to be passionate. A real encounter with the gospel, the kingdom of God, and Jesus Christ is just so transformative, it'll just ooze out of you after a while. Yeah. And that and that's the key. You know, you talked about, you know, real quick, as a pastor, at this time of the year, I get inundated with emails about how to increase your uh, giving at the end of the year and giving you strategies. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, you know, I, I'm trying to unsubscribe from all these email lists because, uh, for one thing, I don't have the time to keep reading it. But the, the second thing is, I believe that if people are captured by the gospel of the kingdom of God, then God will birth in their heart what to give. And that's a lot simpler for me, as opposed to trying to use strategies, which really just come down to manipulation at the end of the day, as as a part that that transformation. And this is why I'm personally so excited. And I just know in my heart that this is a revolutionary message Mm. that in the body of Jesus Christ that that we so need. Frank points out in the book, uh, you know, that the body of Christ uh, is insipid right now, you know, with with the message. If you're looking up the word insipid right now, don't worry about that. I had to do that too. (laughs) And, uh, but uh, yes, and we are, We, we really are. But this message and my prayer is that we'll all catch this message, that mm-hmm. this message will so transform us and that we as a body, and as we talk about different topics, we'll just be so united. One of my favorite verses is in John 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he says, Father, I gave them the glory you gave me so that they would be one. Mm. And so that, that, that we could be the answer mm. to that prayer mm. as a body. Amen. Well, we will continue this conversation in our next episode. Wow, it's over already. It's over already. Man, and we have right. more to say about uh, some of the misconceptions regarding the gospel, the kingdom, and the kingdom of God. Amen. So, folks, we will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.